Good morning, church. Uh, let me raise this up because I'd be preaching like this. All right, just two seconds. Okay. Well, all right. Good morning. We have uh, we have several several people that are out of town. We have about fifty people, I think, right now, forty to fifty, that are at Temple uh, up in Temple at a church called Temple Impact, and they're serving Thanksgiving meals. Um, hot Thanksgiving meals to the the homeless and the marginalized there in uh, uh, in that church, and so we are so thankful for them and what they're doing. Uh, I think we also have uh, 50 or 60 or so online with us every Sunday morning. So hello to those that are online. All right, um, this is a interesting week uh, for me and my family. Uh, as you know, my my mother passed away in July. And you know how families usually rotate Christmas and Thanksgiving and stuff. One year they'll do Christmas and then the next year they'll do Thanksgiving. And, you know, and that's the way you, you uh, uh, keep things, uh, keep wars from happening, basically, as you have to go, you know. And, and really the parents don't care about us. They just want to see the grandkids. Am I right? You know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. <laughs> wow. That'll preach. Um, but uh, okay, so uh, basically this year is, was supposed to be a part low Thanksgiving. And uh, my dad passed away a few years ago and my mom just passed away. And this is the first year that we don't have a part low Thanksgiving. And maybe some of you in the auditorium remember what that was like, you know, to have your first Thanksgiving without your, without your parents and without your family and stuff. And so please, please pray for my family. This is going to be a really interesting Thanksgiving. Uh, I mean, I'm going to, I'm going to miss a lot. So, so please just keep our, uh, uh, keep our family in your prayers. But as I was thinking about my mom a couple days ago and Thanksgiving and stuff, I remember one year we took a trip up to Virginia to visit family. Uh, and I don't know, do you ever wonder why these random stories come to your head? But they do. This random story came to my head. And I remember uh, sitting in the back seat. I was in the sixth grade. And for some reason, or for some reason I checked out of the library. Um, now, for teenagers, the library is a place you go to to get books. <laughs> And you open them up and you read. Okay. Uh, but I went to the library and I got the complete works of Henry David Thoreau. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So I read that in sixth grade um, and that, that was good times. Uh, but, but there's only so much you could read because back in that, uh, that day, I didn't have like a Game Boy or any kind of stuff to keep me busy. So what I did is I decided to pretend that I was a robot for three or four hours of the trip. Okay, I was in the back seat. I'm an only child, so uh, there was no fighting. I mean, well, I fought with myself, but, um, but basically, I was a robot. So the whole time during the trip, I did this. I was like, be boop 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 doop bop boop be dee bop be bop boop be doop. Like I was a break dancing robot for some reason because I just saw like break in two electric boogaloo. I don't know. Anyway, uh, but uh, you know, just be boop boop be doo doo bop be doo bop be doo bop. And I did this hours right? And, and you can just see my dad. I mean, just the, oh man, he's just, mm. but, but he has that look from my mom. Like my mom is like, if you, if you yell at my kid, I swear I will cut you. You know, one of those things, right? So he doesn't say anything because he's scared of my mom. And, um, but finally after three hours on the trip of me going, beep, boop, boop, boop. They're like, what do you want for lunch? I don't know. Does not compute. Beep, boop. You know, I did this all. I don't know. I was a strange kid, right? Uh, finally, my mom turned around and said, what is wrong with you? <laughs> and, and I remember, oh, oh, it was just a story that I thought of this last week. It was just cracking me up. And because I was, because um, honestly, I don't think there's been a day that has gone by in the last few years where I haven't turned around and looked at our country and just wanted to say, what is wrong with you? <laughs> you know, what is going on? Just strange. Am I right? I mean, am I, man, I'm not the only one, right? You know, it's so weird. We live in this like almost like robotic world. I mean, where things just don't make sense. I mean, where like uh, it's, it's one giant face palm. I mean, you know, all of us are just like, oh, this is, oh, this is painful. You know, because in a weird way, everyone is a victim, but no one is to blame in our culture. Everyone is quick to accuse others, but they're slow to acknowledge their own guilt. 
We cry foul when op opponents mislead and, and lie. But when we lie and mislead, we say, well, it's justified for the greater good. Um, we want people to be tolerant as long as it is agrees with our definition of tolerance. We, we want democracy as long as everyone votes the way we want them to vote. We want freedom of press until that another outlet disagrees with our position. We want freedom to do what we want, but we do not want any negative consequences to come from that. We want the ability to choose what is right and true, but are upset when other people do the same. And as I was studying scripture, do you know what the Bible would call this problem? The Bible has a word for this problem, and the word is arrogance. Arrogance, pride, hubris. That's what the Bible calls this problem. See, arrogance is defined as an attitude of superiority manifested in an overbearing manner or, a presumptuous, uh, or in presumptuous claims or assumptions. And what I see happening in our culture right now is I believe arrogance and self-centeredness is tearing apart the very fabric of our country. There is, uh, there is no more unity. There is no more seeing, uh, going and, uh, and trying to be bipartisan in anything. Everything is just about our agendas and what we want. And there's this arrogance of we're right and we demonize the other side. Uh, and, and this is happening not only in our culture, but it has to be happening. It's a byproduct of what's happening in our hearts. It saturates our everyday life, this arrogance. So, uh, so much so that we don't even see it anymore. When I say that you're arrogant or we're arrogant, you start to push back and go, I'm not arrogant. I know arrogance, and I'm not arrogance. But it just, it starts to manifest itself in, a, in, in weird ways. When things don't go our way, we can see our self-centeredness and our arrogance uh, come out, you know? Um, someone doesn't drive the way we want, and so we explode in anger. How dare they do something against us? We take it personally. You know, we take it personally when somebody does that. We disagree with someone on social media, so we go on the attack. How dare they disagree with my position? I mean, this is my thought, and I know what's best. Uh, the school line is taking too long, so uh, this, is, this is a pet peeve of mine. All right, so, so at Gateway, right, there's a system. You drive in. There's a system. There's a system. They've made the system. But some people, yes. Right? But some people were like, I don't want to do what everybody else does. I'm more important than everybody else. And they carve their own lane or they park in their own spot or they do something like that. And you're like, there's a system. Are you better than everyone else? And if you would ask them, I just wonder if they would go, yeah. <laughs> like, a, you know, entitlement, arrogance. I mean, it just kind of exudes off of every page that you read in news. And it drips off of, of just everything in our lives. We swim in this world with so much arrogance and pride that we, don't, we not only don't recognize it, but actually we've taken it to the nth degree where it started to be a, a, a virtue. We look at pride as a virtue. We are addicted to egos. We want our leaders, our musicians, our actors, we want them to be larger than life. We want them to get up and say, I know the right answer and that person doesn't. And, and we're like, yay, you know, and we clap and we, you know, we love the bravado of it all. And we, we love that and we're addicted to that. And that's who, who we elect as leaders or we want to see, uh, you know, at, at a concert or we want to see on the screen. We admire those who are larger than life, outspoken and those arrogant personalities. When you ask the world, how they view Americans, okay? When you ask the world how they view Americans, the first word that comes to mind is arrogant. And I didn't realize this until I moved to New Zealand. I didn't think I was arrogant. I think I'm a pretty humble guy, you know? But uh, I said, what do you mean arrogance? And they said, well, Paul, look at the way you walk. I was like, why are you talking about the way I walk? I think I've got a good walk, you know? Like, I, you know, I'm just walking, right? I'm just, but they said, look, shoulders back, head up. You even walk arrogantly. And I got on the defensive. I was like, that's just ridiculous and stuff. And they said, see, 
you're louder than everyone else in this room right now as you're talking. <laughs> you're the loud American. You're the arrogant American and stuff. And so, so like I said, you can push against that, but I'm just saying that's the way they viewed us. I, I don't, you know, that's the way people viewed me anyway, uh, in some ways. Uh, and yet when I go to scripture, I can't find a sin that God hates more than arrogance and pride. It's, it's, off of every page in the Old Testament and New Testament, you clearly see that God hates pride and arrogance. Even in the, uh, he basically, in, in one of the verses, he lists like five things that God hates and two of them are arrogance. He, he lists twice in a five, uh, in a five thing list, he lists arrogance twice because that's how much he hates it, which should cause us all to pause and step back and look introspectively and, and ask ourselves this question, Lord, is any of that in me? Is any of that in me? And Lord, show me. Uh, I know that I can be blind to my own arrogance. I know that at times I've looked at it as a virtue even, that I'm so warped in my thinking. Father, I need you to reorient my thinking. It causes us all to pause, doesn't it? And to think about our own lives. So we come back to the book of James in verse 4, uh, 13 through 14. It says this. Now listen. <laughs> I love, man, James is just so blunt. He's like, hey, listen. All right. He says, you who say today and tomorrow we will go into this city or that, spend a year there, carry on business and make money or make profit. Why? You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What? is your life? What a great question we could ask ourselves. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. All right, so here's the situation in this passage, all right? There's some guys that are making plans, and they're actually saying what they're going to do. They're sitting there, and they're planning how they're going to expand their business for the next year, okay? Um, they actually decide what they're going to do, not just for the day, but for the year. Now, as an American, that doesn't sound arrogant to me. As an American, doesn't that just sound like good business planning? I mean, it does to me. I, I don't see anything wrong with it, right? I mean, you, oh, you sat down and you made a, a year plan. We don't even have, I mean, here at church, we, we, we try to have a seven-year plan. I mean, you know, businesses have the five-year plan or the three-year plan. That just seems like good organizational theory to me. But James does this. James says, he says, what? Are you kidding me? You don't even know if you're going to be alive next year or even tomorrow. He tells them, you have no control over that. And, and I'm sitting there uh, listening to James going, brother, James, calm down. <laughs> they're, they're just in a planning session. Are you, are you really that angry? But he's, he's telling them, he, he's basically saying, he's talking about this type of arrogance that basically makes plans with no regard for God. That's what he's saying. He's saying, it's okay to plan, but you've got to have a regard for God. James is saying, do you realize just how arrogant that is? Don't you understand that, that your very breath is in the hands of God? Don't you understand that if God was even to blink, everything as we know would crumble? Do you, what is your life? Don't you understand how small you really are? And yet you're going to be so arrogant as to say, well, this is what we're going to do this year and this year. And I think the uh, uh, looking at the plans and looking at the reports and looking at this, I think we we can make a profit of blah, da, 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 never once thinking about God. He's saying that is ridiculous. And I wonder sometimes if we do that in our world, because this is what we do sometimes. Uh, in, in America, we are very dualistic, which means either black or white, either this or that, okay? So when we're in church, we feel like church is a spiritual zone. We talk about spiritual things. We talk about Jesus. We bring God into our life. But when we're out in the secular world, well, business is business. God belongs in church. Business belongs at business. And what James is saying, he's saying, you're crazy. He's saying, no, 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 no. God is sovereign over all. There is no dualistic way of, okay, Church is church, business is business. If you're keeping God out of your business, then he's saying that is ridiculous. 
Um, he says, what is your life? You are a mist, a vapor, a puff of steam. That's all we are in the scheme of life. All we are is dust in the wind. You know? All we are is dust in the wind. Like, or if you've watched Bill and Ted's, dust, wind, dude. You know, yeah, I mean, that's what it is, right? We're just dust in the wind. What he's saying is it is complete and utter arrogance to make plans apart from the sovereignty of God. From the sovereignty of God. Now, now for some, we're saying, okay, what's the big deal? That doesn't sound very arrogant at all. I mean, if a friend came to me and said, hey, uh, Paul, I'm moving to California for a year internship, uh, I wouldn't think, man, that person is so arrogant. How dare they go to California for a, a, a year internship? But what James is saying is making plans apart from the sovereignty of God is taking the driver's seat of your life uh, it's basically putting yourself in the driver's seat of your life where God belongs. So let's keep reading. It says in verse 15, Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, uh, it reminds me of one of my moms saying, if it's the Lord's will, she would always say, uh, well, you know, uh, I guess we're going to do this because Lord willing and if the creek don't rise. Uh, she loves saying that instead of crack me up. The Lord willing and the creek don't rise. I was always like, what, what creek are we talking about here? Anyway, it's just, it cracked me up. Okay. Um, but he says, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this and that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. So as it stands, they are telling God what they're going to do instead of asking God what they should do. How many times have we done that in our life? where we've sat down to make plans. I don't know what it is. Uh, make plans about your business. Make plans about your finances. Make, make plans about your life. You know, um, well, we will, uh, um, we will get married in six, uh, in six months, and we will have 2.3 kids and a white picket fence, and it's going to do this, and a nice 401k that does this, and I will retire at, at, at 65.6 during the year, and, you know, and, and we plan out our life that way. And what, what James is saying is he's saying, look, nothing wrong with planning, but if you... Do not bring God into that mix. If you have it all figured out about what you're going to do and when you're going to do it and what you're going to have and stuff like that, he's like, oh, you're sorely mistaken. Because you have to account for God because he is sovereign. And don't we know? Don't we know that in our life? Haven't we felt that? Haven't we come before God before with our plans? And we've said, well, we're going to do this, 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 and this. But then something kind of comes in and ruins those plans. Maybe it's a vacation. Maybe it's something bigger. Maybe it's your life. Maybe it's the whole trajectory of your life. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to study for eight, nine years, become a doctor, and then something happens and it just explodes that whole plan. That's why it's so important to bring God into the picture. Um, they've taken their life into their own hands and live as if they don't need God. Instead of submitting to God's will, they live by their own rules, which is the definition of arrogance. And again, we need to stop for a second and ask ourselves a question. Am I submitting my life to the will of God or just simply to the will of me? Am I submitting my life? Am I putting my life on the altar? Am I becoming a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God? Because that is the spiritual act of worship. Am I laying my life down and saying, God, you are my creator. What do you want from me? Or do we go to God and say, God, this is what I'm going to do. Now you need to bless me. Do you see the different posture there? God, I've already made up my mind what we're going to do. So if you're a good God, you will bless me. And if you don't bless me, then you're a bad God and I'm not going to worship you anymore. And what James is saying is he's saying it doesn't work like that. What you do is you first submit yourself to God and just trust that God is going to do what he needs to do in your life. It comes down to trust. It comes down to faith. And am I submitting my life to the will of God or to the will of me? When is the last time I asked God about his opinion on my plans, let alone his will? When's the last time I said, when I uttered these prayers, God, where do you want me to go? God, what do you want me to do? God, 
what, what do you want me to spend? God, what do you want me to say? There are two big issues in this passage that can be summed up as the sovereignty of God and the submission of God. So number one, the, 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 the sovereignty of God. We so often forget that God is God and we are not. Oh, man, if the world had a message, it would be, you're your own God. You are the master of your own destiny, the captain of your soul. You can do whatever you want. Life is about you. And we've been discipled and have been swimming in that message for so many years. But what scripture continually reminds us is that no, 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 no. God is God and we are not. And we forget that he is sovereign, which means Lord, King, ruler, master. He has control. He has authority uh, and, and, and his presence to enact his rule. And our only response to the presence in the presence of a sovereign God is to bow down in reverence to him. When we come before an almighty God, we do not hold our head up and put out our arms and say, oh, look at me, God. A only response, you know that you understand the sovereignty of God when you bow down on your knees and you say, Lord, have mercy upon me because I am a man of unclean lips and live among a people of unclean lips. You know you've seen God when your face is on the ground and that is your only response. That's what it is. Now pray for me as I try to get up. Amen. Okay. So he has control. Our only response is to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and who is and who is to come. Say that with me. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. One more time. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. That will be said for eternity because God is sovereign. God is God and we are not. And we have to remember that on a daily basis. We have to continually tell ourselves that over and over. I continually have to tell myself, I am not God. I am not the master of my own life. I only am a servant of God who should submit my life to him. And next, the submission of God. Our prayers should be full of humility. Our prayer should be one of, Lord, if you give me tomorrow, what would you like that I do with it? Don't tell God what you're going to do. Go before him and ask him. Lord, if you give me another day, what do you want me to do? Lord, do you even want me to go into this town and do that? How long do you want me to spend there? Lord, what do you desire from me? And again, going back to Isaiah 6, he desires for us, uh, for us to stand before him with our face to the ground in reverence, bowing down to him, saying, I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips, but here I am, send me. That's what he's calling us to, is he's calling us to submission. So again, let's stop for a second and ask ourselves, Lord, am I really in submission to your will? Lord, am I comparing myself to others who I see as more arrogant and overlooking my own arrogance? Lord, open our eyes so that we may see and act accordingly. And then we go to verse 17. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. You see, we often think of sin as things we are prohibited or not allowed to do. You know, we, uh, uh, we don't drink, cuss, or chew, or hang out with girls that do, you know, that kind of thing, right? Uh, that's, that's kind of what we think about, is, is everything that's prohibited. But James adds another dimension to sin that we often don't think of. He says, whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him, that is sin. So when you completely surrender your life to God, you will ask things like, Lord, if you had complete control over my body and my tongue, what do you want me to do? 
Lord, if you had complete control over my body and my tongue, where do you want me to go? Lord, if you had complete control over my body and my tongue, what do you want me to say? And if it is clear from Scripture and from the calling of God and you do not do that, that is sin. God is calling us to something. And yes, when you submit your life to God, it will mess up your plans. He comes in and he reorganizes everything. We've spent our lives putting our lives in order just the way we want, sort of like our houses, right? You know, we have everything just where we want it and stuff. And he's like this grand designer, like, the, like that, those guys that come in on those design shows, on those HGTV shows or whatever. Um, you know, not that I watch those or anything. Anyway, uh, but anyway, he, he comes in and he goes, nope, tear down that wall. Nope, that's useless. Get rid of this. Don't like that color scheme. Da, da, da. And he, he, he cleans house. But better is one day in his courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorman in the house of God than a king here on earth. Scripture tells us, are you willing to submit your life to that kind of God? Are you willing to to say, yes, God, I will do what you want me to do when he calls What James is saying is you can sin by the things that you have done, but you can also sin by the things that you have left undone, which is called the sin of neglect. Don't just think of sin as as resisting temptation, but also think about it as resisting the will of God. And God has been speaking to all of us, and sometimes we justify things. Well, no, I, you know, God doesn't want me to do that. I I don't have enough money for that, or or I'm 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 too old to do this, or I don't have the skill to do this. And God's up there going, I didn't ask that question. I didn't ask, did you have the skill? I didn't ask if you had the money. I didn't ask if you had uh, the age and the, or the youth or the time. I didn't ask any of those questions. I ask, will you submit to me? Will you submit to me? George Bernard Shaw, he, he once said this. He said, the statistics on death are quite impressive. One out of one people die. Time is a strange commodity, you see, because we can save it. We can't save it. We can't retrieve it, relive it, stretch it, borrow it, loan it, stop it, or store it. We can only use it or lose it. And, and God wants to use the limited time we have on earth for his glory and his power to build his kingdom. And, and, to, and, and in building his kingdom, it shatters our own. The kingdoms that we're trying to build here on earth. You see, time is given us to use in view of eternity. Uh, If you know the movie Gladiator, that awesome scene of what you do here echoes in eternity. (laughs) Good movie. Okay, anyway. Um, But to quote the missionary, uh, a, a famous missionary, he said this. He said, we shall have all eternity in which to celebrate our victories, but only one short hour before the sunset in which to win them. You see, life is too short to live as you want, independent of God and his will. You see, death is not a tragedy. In the Christian faith, death is not a tragedy. Death is not a tragedy. It is a victory. It is a victory. And getting to the end of your life, realizing um, that you spent it all on yourself, that's the tragedy. That's the tragedy, realizing that you, you, you climb to the top of the ladder only to realize you're on the wrong wall. That, that yes, you, you have all this stuff and you've done all these things, but, but, but you weren't any kingdom good. Oh, God, say it's not so. Say it's not so. God wants more for your life. I'm not saying God wants more from your life. It's not a works-based salvation. God wants more for you. In dying to self, we are taught what it means to live. In submitting our lives to God, we are taught what God can do with our short life. In laying down our arrogance and pride, God can use our humility to change the world. And he changes the world by this little phrase. Instead of going to God, telling him what we're going to do, you can say, Lord, Lord willing. 
we're going to go do this and that. Lord willing, I submit my plans to you, God. Lord willing, we will do this and do that and say this and say that. It causes us to pause before we speak and, and lift what we're going to say up to God and say, Lord willing, I'm going to say this. Is this what you want me to say? Uh, it stops us at our checkbook. Who uses the checkbook anymore? Uh, it stops us at our debit card and, uh, and makes us go, Lord, do you really want me to spend this money? You see how that changes your life? changes the entire trajectory of your life because you're submitting everything. Lord, is this what you want me to say? Lord, is this what you want me to spend? Lord, uh, I'm planning on getting up and doing this, this, and this. Is that what you want me to do today? Man, changes your perspective, changes your life, and in so changes the world. Let's pray. Father, what do you want from us? You have given us so much. You have given us life. You have given us an eternal family. We are so grateful, God. We are so blessed. Now, Lord, in light of all the things and resources that you've given us, Father, we're turning it back to you, saying, Lord, here we are, open-handed, Everything we have, our talent, our intellect, our voice, our hands, our feet, our brain, our body, our mouth, our money, our future, our past, our present, our, our kids, our grandkids, our great-grandkids, our legacy, we lay it all down at your feet and ask you, what do you want us to do with this? How do you want us to live? What are you calling us to, God? And Lord, when you do call, may you give us the trust and the faith to live faithfully for you all for your glory, all for your praise, all for your kingdom and not our own. And it's through the name of Jesus. Amen.